What about changing the behavior of people? Can I touch on that one? So <clears throat> I was actually just going to mention that because John delivers his content really tremendously from a first person perspective. And I know that a ton of students um, will walk away from this thinking, okay, great, I can look at my own life. I'm a business leader. I see how this makes sense. I'm already significantly congruent or else I wouldn't be leading a successful business to begin with. How do I make this applicable for other people? So the first thing to consider is there's two ways to approach this with your team, right? You can walk, in your, you can walk into your team and say, team, I've got this values thing. Sit down. We're fucking doing it, <laughs> right? Um, which is traditionally how business owners will approach it. Um, or you can recognize that half or more of the determinants are something you can witness without their participation, right? You obviously don't know what they talk about in their own mind. You obviously don't know what they visualize, but you can see what they express verbally. You can see what they fill their cubicles with and what they fill their space with. You can see where they um, set goals based on what they're writing down, right? You can look at the determinants and look at your employees and ask, what do my employees demonstrate through their behavior is important to them, right? And when you take the time to sit down in your office and look at all of your employees and do a pseudo value determination process on them in addition to yourself, your communication will automatically improve, right? Subconsciously, you now know how to communicate with them, but then you can also apply a conscious approach to that, right? So even though your employees might be saying, I want to get rich, I want to get rich, I want to get rich, um, they're working for you. So obviously, that's not true, right? If they wanted to go get rich, they'd go build their own business. So you can begin to communicate with them in a way they subconsciously want to be communicated in. Like you can communicate with them according to their values instead of solely depending on what they say their values are to you. And so your communication with your employees automatically becomes more authentic and you can now shape your delegations to them according to what you know their values are by behavior instead of by trying to coerce them to do it and reward them and motivate them, right, and incentivize them to do it. Um, so you can approach it both ways. I personally would recommend that when you take this to your employees who've never heard of this stuff before, that you do the work yourself, right? Because not only do you gain mastery in applying the values determination framework, by looking at other people, you get practice in seeing values. And then if you can warm them up by communicating with them, by exemplification in their own values, they're going to say what's changed. And you're going to inspire curiosity, which is part of the sales process. And then when they ask what's going on or when they imply that they're interested in what's going on or what's changed, you can introduce the idea without significant resistance that, hey, we're going to do the value determination structure, right? Or, or do a, a workshop in the business. And, and this is kind of what I've learned. I personally find that works a whole lot better because you come in cold and they don't want to be told how the world works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to add something to that. Every human being, because they live and filter their reality according to their values, they, not intentionally, but they project their values onto other people. Your mother, your father, both had different values. They projected their values onto you. One day they wanted to make sure you got your education. One day they wanted to make sure you were healthy. Whatever their values were, they were going to protect it. We do the same as leaders. So if we perceive that their values are less important in the world than our own, we have a tendency to be on track. If we're going to be, anytime you expect another individual to live in your values without you communicating the value of doing so in their values, you're going to get what I call anger, aggression. You'll blame, you'll feel betrayed. You'll criticize, you'll feel challenged. And you'll feel depressed about the team because you're expecting them to live in your values. They're not going to. They can't. What they can do is identify their values, and we can make a link between what they're doing and their values, so they're fulfilling the values. So if you're clear on what job responsibilities are, and we've now linked it to their values, you're going to find it now that they're going to do it, not because of you, not because of the company, not because of the job, but because it's now fulfilling to their values. And when you're talking to them, if you were to talk to a customer, it's interesting, we have many classes on sales, which are great. Many classes on sales. They're all over the place. Because we realize that the common denominator is that, that customer. So we learn how to find out established needs, 
and uh, confirm needs before we offer solutions. But we don't realize that we're selling work to our employees and their customers. It's like a customer. They're living, they're trying to fulfill their values, and if you sell the responsibilities and job duties in terms of their values, they'll buy. Same kind of uh, arrangement. So a caring leader will identify the values of the people that they delegate to, find out how those values serve them, because if they can't see how the employees' values serve them, they're going to want to talk down to them and try to coerce them, thinking they know them. Which autocratically, automatically, lowers the type of people you have working for you. There's a, there's a scale of leaders. Uh, the highest leader hires people greater than them around them. The lowest leader is a person that they're greater than the people they hire around them. So if you're not caring about those people's values, when they're engaged, when they become masters, you'll end up in the opposite role. You'll be an autocrat talking down with incompetent people. So you have not only determine your own values, determine their values, <coughs> make sure they clear job descriptions, responsibilities, and delegation, but care enough to communicate those values and their values, and that won't occur if you don't see how their values is going to serve your company. So another exercise is to actually take what their values are collectively and how it's serving you to have them there. Because if they're dedicated to their family and making sure those kids go to school and dedicated to their grandma who's senile, and dedicated to their health and fitness, and you don't see that's important, you hire them. The drug said that's your responsibility. You're the one who hired them. Either get somebody else that's more aligned with what the values of the job description is, or communicate in those values so they get what they want while they're working. If they do, you'll have more to be able to delegate, less have to be micromanaging and distracting you from the highest part. Is there any point where, whether it's like an employee or maybe it's like someone you're partnered with, um, where the values are so unaligned where you know you don't even bother making that exercise? So for example, like if you're going through a new hire and on their resume their skill sets are amazing, but then you sit down and you do you know an exercise like a value alignment exercise or some sort of exercise like that, is that um, is there a point where you just say no? You can't change someone's values, correct me if I'm wrong. There's, a, there's not only a, a point you say no, there's a little science to do. So oh, okay. Might not write this. Okay. Follow it. I just got back from Tokyo a few days back and um, doing that, exactly that, helping companies do that. When you're hiring somebody, uh, you have about a dozen steps. You first uh, discern what exactly it is that you are looking for mm -hmm. and what needs to be done. You're then looking and compiling that into some sort of job description, at least to put them in. You're then uh, looking inside, hopefully first, to see if there's somebody here that wants that job, because you're going to piss them off if you give them to somebody else and they want them. So always look within before you look with that, just in case. If you find nobody inside, you look outside. And you can either do it through whatever means to get that person, from recruiting services to headhunters to um, putting ads out, who knows what. But when you get somebody that looks like with their resume is something that might be a fit, um, the next step is an interview. You screen them down, might have a preliminary interview to talk about it. Can they talk English? Can they talk this? Can they basic stuff? If they pass that, you're down to the top three people, let's say, to decide. Here's where a little tool will be a very good page. You go in there and have them fill out the value determination. I would not hire anybody without that. Because without that, you really don't know what they're dedicated to. And you're going to be fooled because they can say anything they want, you're going to find out the hard way. So you do the value determination process. It takes no more than 30 minutes. And before you even meet with them, they can be doing it, either with somebody that knows how to do it, Alex, uh, those people that do it, you can do it, or um, you want to have them go online and do it and check it. Be wise for everybody to learn how to do it anyway, for themselves, for all employees. But once that's done, you then come in with a job description and the vision of the company, mission of the company, primary objective of the company, or the department at least, that they're going to work in. Once you have that, you ask them a simple question. You sit them down, straight facing them, and you say, here's the first job responsibility that I'm looking for, to hire for. 
How specifically is that job duty going to help you fulfill what's most important to you? Which in this case, I see as your, your children, uh, your children's education, and your spiritual studies. Which may be the first. It may not be an educator. This may be a job, may not be an executive position. If they hesitate more than a second, and definitely three seconds, put an end. Because the speed in which they can answer that question will determine the fluency and the congruency. If the answer is fluent, there's congruency. You can't fake it. If they go like this, uh, let me think about that. Uh, if they have to look and look in their eye dials and look in the stations to try to find an answer, okay. if they roll it off and you see a, kind of an enthusiasm about it, go to check. And go down the job description. If 20% of them, right off the bat, are exes, say that'll be all. Thank you very much. Don't even bother. But if at least 80% of them are checks, you have a potential candidate. You still want to check their references. You still want to go in and um, you know do all the things you do normally in hiring. But if they're not congruent right off the bat, if they're not fluent, uh, you're going to have problems. You're going to have to micromanage them, incentivize them. And they can't fake this. They won't be able to fake it because they're not knowing to ask this question. They, won't, they can't prepare for this question because they don't know what the job description is. So they can make a link between that job description and what you're expecting. And it needs to be really clear. And with what's highest on their value, they'll go, yeah. And I just did this in Tokyo. And uh, we nailed everybody there that was not inspired by the jobs. It was really obvious. We took, we, we had to go through the five things that they absolutely inspired to do in their job, the five things that they absolutely despised in their job, and you, everybody in that room in the training process could see exactly which ones were fluent, which ones were influent. So by going through there, it's another screening mechanism that can save you a lot of headaches. Now, if 80% of them are congruent and fluent, then great. But there's also another way of linking them to get the other 20% by simply asking how specifically doing these actions will help you fulfill your highest values and helping them make the links. Because once they make enough links, you'll have now full congruency and a very high productivity. Because engagement and productivity and their commitment to the, the cause of the company will be based on it. If they pass that one, then you go to the mission, vision, and primary objectives. How specifically is fulfilling these in the company or in the department helping you fulfill your highest values? If that's congruent and that's congruent, you've got a pretty good potential person here. There's probably going to want to grow in the company long term. If this is congruent, but this isn't congruent, the vision and mission isn't, you have somebody that's planning on coming and working and learn everything they can from you and opening up a competitive company. That's what we're doing. So um, I want to tie that idea back to. <clears throat> This page, um, John talked about earlier that when something is low on your values, you're automatically going to avoid doing it, right? You'll require motivation and incentives, uh, which is another way of saying that if you perceive something to be painful um, and it isn't congruent with your values, your, your behavior will not demonstrate that those tasks or those assignments or those job duties will get accomplished. So I have combined the concept of the application of pain as well as the application of the value determination process um, to a 79-page hiring manual, which is available to all of you. Um, I have not yet had a client actually put in the effort to like, m make this hiring process work. I've had clients uh, do portions of it, um, primarily because they ask for it when they need a person. Um, and it's kind of like money. You should acquire it when you don't need it, so that when you need it, you can use it. Because when you need it, you're not going to get it. Um, I would recommend that you ask me for it, which you can just have, um, and do the work it's going to take to be prepared before you actually need to hire someone. Because I can guarantee that if you apply this hiring process, which takes nine weeks start to finish for any given candidate, that it will run those candidates through their paces in terms of the application of pain to prove that they're willing to tolerate it and therefore that the job description and that the position you want to fill is high priority. And it will also guarantee that they're congruent in terms of their values. Um, the clients who've applied the portions of it, their employees are still with them. 
and they're still engaged and they're still fulfilled by their jobs. And so in the limited data that I have around that hiring process, it's strong, stronger than any non-hiring process users that I've seen anyway. So um, ask us for the process and then do the work to get prepared for the next time you need to hire someone. Because if you put someone through the process, it will minimize the requirement for your time to be invested, which is important, right? Like as the leader of an organization, you should not be doing phone interviews, back checks, primary interviews, group interviews. You shouldn't really be focusing on it at all until you're qualifying the final candidates. So it's structured to save the most valuable resource in your company the most time. It's executable by your team. And it's built around deselection rather than selection, because we can guarantee the process of deselection by values. We cannot guarantee that you're qualified to select anybody. And it will guarantee that it's congruent in terms of their values, because I've applied John's work to it. So ask me for it. Do the work. Prepare yourself for the next hire. And I would be very surprised if you didn't find an ideal candidate. Someone make a ticket for Jason? And Kathy? And Jason, you guys have it? Okay. Yeah, we'll get some tickets made and send it out. Okay.